when you meditate, try to think of it as a process of exploration. Don't have a lot of preconceived notions about what you're going to find. Because if you go into it thinking that you're just going to reprogram your mind, well, you could reprogram your, your mind into seeing almost anything. If you believe firmly enough that If you saw pink clouds all around you, that would be a good sign. Okay, you could make yourself see pink clouds. If you believe firmly enough that if you see the whole world as blue, you'd find your happiness. Okay, then you would make yourself see the whole world as blue. So that's no indication that the world really is blue. So instead you're asked to explore. The Buddha doesn't give a lot of descriptions of the goal. He gives a few hints, but he gives a lot of detail on how to find it. It's like a treasure hunt. He says, you go into the next room and you look in this particular way, and you're going to uncover something of a lot of value. And he gives you a couple of tests for whether the object you find is the valuable object or not. Is it subject to change? Is there any stress? Is there any sense of possession? In that case, then it's not the, what you're looking for. But what precisely it is you're looking for, he, he gives only a few hints. So that's what we should focus on, is the process of what we're doing. What you think about is awakening. There are three knowledges. There was the knowledge of previous lives, knowledge of beings passing away and being reborn in line with their karma, and then the knowledge of the Four Noble Truths. Now those first two knowledges were still not all that certain. There was an element of possible doubt. I mean, you have visions of previous lifetimes doesn't mean you actually had previous lifetimes. You see people being reborn passing away, being reborn in line with their karma, does that mean that it really happens? And you can see all kinds of things. But the Buddha realized that okay, the, the way to test those visions lay on that issue of karma, what people do. This is one thing you can know directly. You can know directly what you're doing. When you focus the mind, you know you're focusing the mind. When the mind settles down, you know it's settling down. When the mind wanders off, you know it's wandering off. These are things you really know. When you experience suffering, okay, you know. When you experience a lack of suffering, you really know. So those are the two issues the Buddha focused on. The feelings of suffering and the knowledge of actions. And he wanted to see, was there a connection between the two? These two are, th these two are very certain things. No one can dissuade you. When you're feeling suffering, no one can say, that's not really suffering. You're not suffering. And when you do something, you know that you're doing it. So the Buddha wanted to see if that, the way to test that teaching on karma was, the question was, are people's experience of, experiences of pleasure and pain, are they related to their actions? So he looked in the immediate present. Okay, what are you doing? What, what are you doing right now? He said, "Is there any relationship between what you're doing right now and an experience of pain or lack of pain?" That was the question they asked himself. Then the next question, when he saw that there was a connection, okay, is it possible not to do something? What happens then? So we worked to let go of the craving and ignorance that lead to action, that are involved in action, see what happens then. So he's dealing with realities that are immediately apparent, immediately present. And he was running an experiment to see, okay, what happens when you do it this way? What happens when you do it that way? So he wasn't dealing in visions. He wasn't dealing in 
all sorts of strange perceptions. He was just looking at very ordinary things, the actions of the mind, and seeing what they resulted in. So this is what we're doing as we meditate here. That's what the focus should be on. We're not just sitting here waiting for enlightenment to drop on us. We're looking for an enlightenment to what are we actually doing right now? Because it's amazing how much the mind can disguise that from itself. This is a tendency we've had ever since we were little children. To sort of hide our intentions from ourselves. Because sometimes our intentions are not all that sociable. Not all that admirable. And so we can find ways of justifying almost anything to ourselves. And in the process, we learn how to be a little bit dishonest. Sometimes not just a little bit, sometimes quite dishonest with ourselves. And so when we're meditating, we want to take our basic honesty and focus it on this issue here. Let's really get truthful about what's going on right now. We take what honesty we have. This is not to say that we are by nature either honest or dishonest, it's just that these are patterns that we've developed. And we're trying to take advantage of our skillful habits to uproot the unskillful ones. So how do we get clear about our intentions? You have to make the mind really still. That's why we're focused on the breath. And so we give it an intention, stay with the breath, don't move. Don't go wandering off to other things. And then we give it a further intention. Okay? Try to breathe as comfortably as possible. Here you are, immediate exercise in the relationship between your actions and feelings of pleasure and pain. So you want to develop that particular sensitivity as much as you can. So it's the combination of the stillness of your focus and the point where you are focused, right at this issue of intention and its relationship to pleasure and pain. This is why breath meditation opens things up in the mind, because it's focused on the real issues. The Buddha once said that insight is knowledge of sankhara, the, the, what they call fabrication. And fabrication comes in three ways. There's physical fabrication, that's the breath. Verbal fabrication, that's the directed thought and evaluation that gives rise to words. And then there's mental fabrication, your feelings and your perceptions. Well, when you're focused on the breath properly, all these things are brought together. There's the physical fabrication of the breath, there's a directed thought and evaluation directed to the breath, and there's the perceptions of the breath and the feelings that arise from how you deal with the breath. So everything you really need to know for awakening is right here. And what is the process of fabrication? There's a lot of intention involved in there, and that's what you want to uproot. Because intention lies at the essence of action. So the Buddha's genius was to realize that the things we need for awakening, the things we need to understand the problem of suffering in our lives, all lie right here. And it's simply a question of bringing them together and getting a really steady gaze so you can see what's going on clearly. What happens when you really focus your attention right here and don't let yourself get distracted? What happens when you develop your sensitivities in this area? What do you find? And John Mahabua talks about his time with the John Mun, saying that John Mun would give long Dharma talks, sort of sketching out the whole path of the practice. Because at any one time there would be often be lots and lots of different people coming to study with him all at different stages of the practice. And so in order to cover everybody, he would start from the most basic levels on up to the highest. And John Mahabhu noticed that as he was giving his Dharma talks, he'd get to some really crucial parts of the practice, really important discoveries that would move you from one level to the next. And he wouldn't describe them in detail. He'd move on to the next level, just kind of set up the problem and then move on. He was mystified for a while. Then he began to realize, if you explain everything in a lot of detail, people will come into those points with a lot of preconceived notions. And the preconceived notions will get in the way. So 
the important thing about listening to the Dharma is that the Dharma points you. In fact, the word desana, which means, which is the word they use for a Dharma discussion or a Dharma explanation, literally means pointing to. It points you to the places where you should look, gives you instructions on how to look, and then it's up to you to see. When the Buddha would give instructions for meditation, he wouldn't say, go do insight. He'd say, go practice, go practice jhana. In the course of doing the practice, you have to develop tranquility. And the insight you develop at the same time, which you have to do as well. The insight becomes your own, because it's something you discover. You notice things that you didn't notice before. Because after all, what else do you think enlightenment would be? It's not that the skies open and some god comes down. or some light comes down from the outside. It's simply a matter of looking very carefully at what's already here, and looking to see what happens when you get your focus really well, well tuned, get it steady. You develop all the skills you need to see clearly, learning how to look, learning where to look, but the actual seeing when it becomes clear seeing. That's something you can't will. But the potential for it is all right here. So look carefully. There's a lot to see here, a lot to understand, a lot to explore and discover. simply up to us to want to discover it enough and to apply ourselves to what needs to be done.